mailing lists. And the dynamic coalitions, they work throughout the year, and this session here is to highlight their work and to show to the, the broader IGF community what they have been working on. And the IGF uh, community will also benefit from their work as we go forward uh, doing intersessional work and setting priorities for the future. Uh, we are very fortunate to have Tatiana Tropina with us from the Max Planck Institute. She moderated the session last year. We gave her the task to be an agent provocateur, to ask provocative questions, and all the dynamic coalitions present here have prepared a paper, 13 of them. There are 17 dynamic coalitions all in all, and more are still in formation. They all have their own session in the IGF, but this is a common session to highlight uh, their hard work and uh, give us input for thought. This year's uh, motto is uh, to shape the digital future, contribute to the digital future. Tatiana, over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Tatiana Tropina. I'm from Max Planck Institute in Germany. And I think it's a shame that we're missing some of the representatives of the dynamic coalitions few because I was going to start uh, with the tough questions to one of them but apparently he's hiding his himself somewhere and I hope he will appear soon so just as a short introduction I don't know if you read all the 13 papers of dynamic coalitions but if you haven't read them I did and I'm going to ask the questions based on the papers and as uh, I wanted to start from the core from the dynamic coalition on core internet values but I don't see the representative here oh no so, um, Olivia, while you're, <laughs> yes, we are starting from the core. And I think this would be my longest question to representative of the NAMIC coalition, because I find your paper very interesting. You say that you're going to add the new value which you define as freedom from harm. Historically, freedom from harm referred to environmental regulation, to the s health and safety issues, so strictly mandate of the government. Uh, you don't define this value. And interestingly, uh, you just refer to some you know, broad uh, threats like IoT and so on. Don't you think that referring to the word harm um, in connection to something that traditionally was a governmental mandate can hamper your other core values because I believe there would be plenty of actors who would jump on the words freedom from harm to restrict, for example, um, um, openness of the internet or decentralization of the internet. Thank you very much. You have three minutes. Thank you, Thank you uh, very much, Tatiana. Um, so it's Olivier Grappin-Blanc from the Dynamic Coalition on Core Internet Values. Um, it's actually a question that we have spent considerable time discussing during our meeting earlier uh, this week. Uh, in fact, we went all the way back to the discussions of the World Conference on International Telecommunications, uh, week at 12, where there was a discussion about uh, the safety of the internet and the security of the internet and the uh, objection from several countries, including the country that I um, uh, was uh, part of, or, or, or the uh, delegation that was part of, uh, the UK delegation, uh, which objected to the safety or security aspect being uh, hardwired uh, in the, uh, uh, at the time, the International Telecommunication Regulations, and uh, proposed language uh, such as robustness of uh, the network, which can be interpreted in various ways, but is not as dangerous, and I put that in quotes, uh, as far as interpretation is concerned for some governments or some countries to restrict freedom of speech and other uh, uh, rights and, and uh, um, uh, sort of have negative consequences uh, in, uh, in uh, the, the development of the internet. So we discussed this at, well, for a pretty long time and we have not reached an actual response for this. So we still keep as freed freedom from harm as being a placeholder for saying, well, devices should be secure or should have some form of self-securing mechanism of some sort. And I think one of the things that we've uh, decided on doing is to work hand in hand with other dynamic coalitions, uh, in specifically, uh, specifically the dynamic coalitions on IoT, Internet of Things, uh, because they've worked on an ethical framework, uh, which I'm sure uh, Martin will tell you about, um, and that could be something that will actually uh, help us in our definitions as well. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, <coughs> especially for being so quick. And I'm going to turn to Martin, with whom you're going to collaborate closely, I believe. But I don't I'm not going to ask him about ethical framework. I'm going to ask you, Martin, about your work on transparency and accountability framework. And it struck me a bit in your paper, and I'm going to cite, that you are going to develop this paper taken like I I with respect to the current legislation and, and, and you know, kind of um, with regard to the future regulation. I'm going to ask you what current legislation you mean, because laws are different in different countries. So when you're thinking about transparency and accountability framework for the IOT, are you going to take into account some national laws, international laws, or some emerging international standards. Can you elaborate on this, please? Because I do find this idea fascinating, but the reference to law makes me a bit puzzled. Thank you. Thank you, Tatiana. And, and thank you, Olivier, because in a way it does link back to uh, ethical framework in the end. Um, I think taking, uh, respecting uh, legislation means that what we try to do is not coming instead of legislation. Uh, we're not uh, thinking we can uh, reset laws across states. It's really about developing a way forward that will serve the world. If we talk in that on a general level, it's, it's a very general framework where you have to use terms like ethics in the understanding that it means different things in different parts of the world, if in the understanding that values are different. So you have, but still you need to have this understanding at the global level that uh, after that is uh, implemented locally, uh, preferably in a multi-stakeholder way, because that's what works best in this society. Um, with respect to transparency, uh, uh, it's a precondition for accountability. If there's no transparency, how can you keep anybody accountable for that? Uh, in that way, uh, it's clear to us that uh, it's very difficult for the common user or the small business to, to comprehend what's going on. And uh, how do we come with a way that we can see that IoT applications are set up in a way to serve and not breaking the law? How can we check into commercial source code, for instance, in a way that is trusted? by the users and that's also acceptable from a for, from a business perspective of acceptable at least the feeling that uh, this is a trusted way forward so that's the transparency part and uh, following that accountability uh, will be not only for the industry but in a way for the whole chain of users in which we do need to understand that we cannot expect for instance, end users to be accountable for complex things. So it's up to the service provider to provide solutions for which people can take their own accountability in a way just like healthcare. Uh, you can not make general practitioners fully uh, accountable for somebody being healthy. That person needs to be something about it themselves too. But you shouldn't expect them to operate themselves. So I'm sorry, I, st I think I still have 15 seconds to ask you, please don't use timer this time. So you're basically referring rather to the spirit of law than the letter of law, right? I, I think it's the principle that we are not thinking that we are uh, uh, overruling uh, local legislation. Thank you very much. And I'm going to turn another question about the law to the dynamic coalition on blockchain. I saw that you raised so many interesting issues in your paper, um, referring to different problems and, and discussions around blockchain. But the, you know, these discussions on blockchain and regulation in the last year made so many headlines. And here I'm going to cite a bit. Uh, you say that you are considering the issues on whether and how law can provide guideposts for blockchain governance. Could you elaborate a bit on the position of your dyna dynamic coalition on blockchain law and governance? Okay, great. Um, hi, thanks a lot. Um, so firstly, let me say that kind of uh, fundamentally blockchains are software running on a bunch of computers on a distributed network, usually the internet. 
And so there's a bunch of different processes that are involved in blockchain governance. There's the processes that govern the nodes uh, what, and choose what software they run, and there's processes that govern the software repositories. Uh, and there are uh, governance uh, institutions and norms that form around the processes that govern nodes who all want to be connected so that they can peer and be, have a useful network. Um, you know, they need to run compatible implementations. And there's governance processes around the software and changes that are made to the software. Um, and so there's, those are the, and then the question in, from a legal point of view is which of these processes are inside your jurisdiction? And another question is um, from the point of view of the usefulness of blockchain in, um, in institutions and in helping institutions achieve their goals is like if those processes are inside your jurisdiction, then can you actually rely on the blockchain um, to, you know, create a, some kind of institution or, 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 or that is outside of your jurisdiction and therefore that people can um, trust you won't tamper with? Does, does that help? Yeah, it does. Thank you very much. Um, and I will move to another dynamic coalition who cited one of the documents or built their paper on the documents for me in rather an unexpected way. And John, I'm talking about your dynamic coalition on child online protection because I, I think that for, for me it was quite striking that you built your paper upon the Declaration of Rome adopted by the Catholic Church. And I want to ask you in this regard, are you using this document um, as a um, general idea that was adopted by the Holy See to support your approach, or are you going to exercise any of the 13 recommendations outlined by them? So what is the synergy between your uh, dynamic coalition and this particular paper? Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, so the, the, the dynamic coalition on um, ch child internet safety, uh, um, which I represent here, uh, was represented at the meeting in Rome, um, uh, uh, which was convened uh, by the Pontifical Gregorian University, which is essentially the Vatican's uh, university. But it was an offspring as well, it, so it worked in, con in conjunction with the uh, We Protect Global Alliance. The, the We Protect Global Alliance, for those of you who, who, who are not familiar with it, uh, was initiated by the British government um, three years ago, and then about 18 months ago it merged with an EU-US initiative to become uh, the Global Alliance. And, and a quite a number, or several at any rate, of the Dynamic Coalition uh, members were represented in Rome uh, at the meeting um, that you've referred to, that issued the, the Declaration of Rome. And we saw a great deal of synergy between uh, what we've been doing for many, many years and what the, the Catholic Church in the form of the, the Holy Father, the, the Pope, uh, decided to support. And whatever you might think about the Catholic Church as an institution and its history, particularly in this space, I don't think anybody doubts the personal commitment of the new Pope, of Pope, Fra well, it's not so new now, Pope Francis. He's a, a very well-regarded and globally respected uh, ethical leader. So we could see a great deal of overlap and synergy between what we were trying to do and what the, the Catholic Church now seems to be very committed to doing. And my, by the way, let me just point out, in Rome, it wasn't just Catholics who were present taking part in the conference. There were lots and lots of different people from different religions and from no religions. Uh, ECPAT itself is, is a, a completely secular organization. If it was otherwise, I don't think I could work for it. Uh, so it wasn't, uh, this was not about promoting, if you like, a Catholic agenda, but it was recognizing the personal leadership of the Pope the leadership of the Catholic Church and its continuing importance in the world and bringing those people together around commonly agreed, uh, agreed goals. And we hope this will give an impetus to governments and parliaments around the world to start looking at these issues afresh. Thank you very much, because I was afraid to ask this question in a controversial way, but basically in your response you addressed everything. Thank you. <laughs> and now I'm moving to another dynamic coalition who deals not really with protection of vulnerable targets, but with access for people with disabilities and impa uh, uh, impairments. And you refer in your paper to the concepts which I find fascinating, the concept of universal design. 
devices that are designed to ensure accessibility for anyone, including people with disabilities. And you refer to a case study of Pakistan, to the work of the ITU, and so on. And I wanted to ask you how your dynamic coalition is going to advance the, the, this concept of um, universal design. Is there anything you're already doing in this regard? Because I really think this is a great job. Thank you. Yes, uh, th thank you. It is a, g a great question, and, and uh, it is something that we are planning to discuss in our uh, upcoming uh, meeting later today. And um, I, I personally think that more uh, discussions, more connections with other dynamic coalitions is really important. We had a session yesterday where uh, we uh, had the participation of uh, Martin Botterman from, from the Dynamic Coalition I IoT, we were talking about um, IoT accessibility. Um, because it is a cross-cutting issue and because it, it does impact uh, vulnerable people, not only people with disabilities directly, but also uh, the, the uh, cross-benefits to other groups, um, like you mentioned, uh, the, 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 the these cases show really that, for instance, uh, something like captioning, which we're using today, not only for accessibility, but also for language diversity and, and, and supporting many other use cases. So I think um, with all these developments that we have, um, all the uh, speakers uh, in, 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 in the prior um, um, uh, s sessions now, uh, uh, sorry, the, the, the prior speakers, um, all these developments that we're seeing, be it IoT, uh, be it uh, blockchains or, or even uh, the, the aspect of uh, decentralized web and net neutrality impact people with disabilities very greatly. And I think we need to do more efforts here in having the Dynamic Coalition uh, more integrated. It's a cross-sectional aspect, more integrated in other Dynamic Coalitions. Thank you very much. And I'm going to move back a bit to a legal side um, and, and, and the issues of responsibilities and regulation. And Nicolo from uh, DC on platform responsibility, I have a question for you. You're making a very good point uh, and very interesting point about us giving so much power and so much information to the platforms so they almost become regulators. While you're making this point, I, I, I really want to ask you, do you see any remedies against this? Can this be remedied? What is your opinion on this, UDC? Thank you. Thank you, Tatiana. <coughs> so uh, in, in this um, output document, we uh, analyze different range of policy options that are available to address um, the basically delegation of powers from governments to uh, platforms and how to ensure the maintenance of uh, human rights in this framework. So um, w I just want to make the point that we don't uh, suggest that the regulation should apply, you know, regardless of the context. Uh, we should make sure that there is a market failure before there is actual uh, regulation. Uh, but there are other modes of intervention which can be um, up to uh, address the market failures, um, taking into consideration um, the context. So uh, one of the possibilities is to adopt uh, co-regulation. Mm -hmm. So you have some principles laid out by the government according to which uh, platforms should operate uh, within boundaries. Um, another possibility is to um, impose a secondary liability for uh, uses that are made of the platforms. Um, so this is also not, strictly speaking, regulation, like common and control regulation, but is another way of intervening. And then there is a possibility of self-regulation. But in the case of self-regulation, the state should not simply absolve its responsibilities by delegating it to uh, the market. Uh, it should maintain an adequate supervision um, over this process. And it should, in particular, ensure that there are concrete mechanisms for remedy because this is a joint duty that uh, businesses and governments have according to the RAGI principles on business and human rights. And I have a couple of suggestions with regard to concrete mechanisms that are being discussed by the Dharma Coalition. Um, so the first one is a trust framework 
um, that allows consumers to be empowered by not having to read all the terms and conditions, but um, enabling the rise of third parties that much like in food and pharmaceuticals will determine which um, kind of information is unfair uh, to uh, provide to consumers in terms of service. And the second mechanism which is increasingly being discussed is the right to explanation for uh, any automated decision making that significantly impacts individuals. This is in the European Data Protection Framework and I think platforms should provide an API that allows users to engage into requests for explanation uh, so that we have a personalized transparency much like we have a personalized service. Thank you very much. It's incredible how much one can explain in three minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Nicola. Um, and I found another uh, interesting point on the digital platforms in the paper um, of the DC on gender and internet governance. Bishaha, I very much liked um, in, in, in the paper of this dynamic coalition the notion of consent for women, for women, these two tire notion consent for production of anything and consent for distribution of anything. And you also say in the paper, your, your coalition says in the paper, that the, the law will probably not solve this problem. And there is a need for digital platforms to build in these um, ethical norms into their operations. I'm wondering if your dynamic coalition has already some thoughts about how make digital platform doing this. Um, are you going to cooperate with any digital platforms on promoting this? Um, so what kind, of what kind of actions are you taking in this regard? Thank you. Asking a very provocative question. Um, I think for us, what we would really like to explore uh, is, you know, people are already talking about privacy by design, right? And consent is sort of related to privacy. So I think what might be interesting is to explore the possibility of actually thinking about consent by design. How do you actually get platforms to think about consent not as an add-on or not as a technicality which is not meaningful in the way that it is actually implemented, but how can we get platforms to really think about their users in a way in which consent gets embedded in the design and the architecture of the platform. Because quite honestly, I think what laws help us is with dealing with violations of consent after they have occurred. But that cannot be, the solution cannot be that it will continue to be a violation and the law will address it. So I think what we need is to think about how do we prevent consent from being violated in the first place? And also, how do we build in an ethics of consent? Is there a way, I mean, often the violation occurs on a platform of consent. Oh, sorry, I meant to say the violation of consent occurs on a platform. But it's often users violating each other's consent by publishing things that are consensually produced, but are being non-consensually distributed. So, you know, with all the wonderful imaginative sort of things that are happening in the world of artificial intelligence, the internet of things, etc., we would really love to talk to platforms about developers really using their sort of imagination and their skills and capacities to think of this as an interesting problem that needs a design solution. Thank you very much, because I did think, like, from the entire paper, which raises many issues about women privacy, about women's security, I thought that was a very interesting point about consent, because I didn't consider it like this like before. So thank you very much. And I'm going to move to the Internet, uh, Internet Rights and Principles Coalition. And... Um, Minda, last, I, I, I want to build upon what I asked last year, because I asked last year your dynamic coalition, what was your definition of success in uh, advancing the charter, in promoting it? And now I see that your dynamic coalition came up with the educational resource guide. So I want to ask you how 
are you going to marry this concept of charter as principles that have to be adopted and the, 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 the educational resource guide, so how is it advancing your goals? Thank you. Thank you, Tatiana. Um, it's a very good question, actually, because um, as you know, the uh, Internet Rights and Principles Coalition has been working on developing and promoting the Charter of Human Rights and Principles for the Internet uh, over the past uh, few years, so since uh, uh, 2011, when it was first launched. Um, uh, the Charter has these 21 articles that we're trying to promote over the years and um, is obviously based on international laws uh, and norms, uh, human rights, uh, international uh, law and norms. And um, uh, for the first work of the coalition uh, after the launching the charter was to translate it into different languages so that it could be accessible to a, a wider audience. Uh, and then campaigning uh, at uh, national and international level for the recognition as well of the charter and to include the, the charter in uh, um, uh, uh, policy making and uh, um, laws uh, um, that uh, uh, are dealing with internet governance and human rights online. Uh, so uh, the resource guide comes as uh, the a natural next step so basically what we are trying to do now is to unpack the 21 articles from the charter and to look uh, how each one of these articles uh, call up specific issues that are relevant to specific regions, uh, communities and countries. Uh, so the, uh, the work contained in this charter can actually then include uh, suggestions, case scenarios uh, uh, that illustrate issues arising from these 21 articles of the Charter. And we uh, aim to develop a document that is an open-ended document, so everyone can uh, have feedback, input, uh, and these hopefully will be very helpful uh, to our a wider audience because it can be used not only in classrooms, uh, but also uh, for governments uh, to promote the charter for lawmakers, policy makers, uh, for businesses, and even the technical community. Uh, so we hope that this is really the next step to uh, put the charter out there. And I think that there's a lot of uh, uh, interest in the charter. So just to give you a, a very simple example, my only copy that I brought, annotated and everything, uh, all the other ones already disappeared. I left mine upstairs and it was gone in minutes. So <laughs> I cannot show it uh, here today, but obviously uh, there's a lot of people that come to us and ask more about the charter and would like to use it. Um, we had a session just two days ago on, uh, on the resource guide and we had loads of inputs, great inputs from all around the world, from all the regions, from Latin America, from Southeast Asia. So I think that this is the obviously the next step and is I think is going to open up the charter to a very uh, a big audience from now on. Thank you very much. And I'm going to move to another questions of rights. Um, to um, the sea on community connectivity. Luca, normally when I hear a or read anything about creation of new rights, like right to be forgotten or some other right, I'm very skeptical. But I saw in your paper a very, con a very interesting concept. You refer to the right to network self-determination. And I did find it interesting. So can you elaborate on this, please? Tatiana, so uh, actually, uh, well, first of all, let me say that our annual uh, report here is made up of uh, 10 contributions by 18 different members of the coalitions that have cooperated together. At the end, we have also a collective document, the Declaration of Community Connectivity, that we developed through a multi-stakeholder process over the past year with several consultations. Uh, in the various, uh, in the various contributions, well, the, my contributions is actually based on the empirical observation of what uh, community networks are. They are crowdsourced networks. 
and actually they demonstrate that uh, there is already uh, de facto a right to network self-determination. It could be the 22nd uh, right of your charter, uh, which is the right of every individual, of every community, to uh, associate freely, define in a democratic fashion uh, the management, development, implementation of network infrastructure as a common goods, so that everyone can freely access, share, uh, and uh, uh, impart innovation and information. So it's a matter, so if we want people to define and contribute to their digital development, this is essential. And actually, I'm not arguing this as a co new concept that I want to put, uh, to throw uh, in the basket of the new concepts. I, I'm arguing this because, first of all, it already exists in practice. I analyze in, the, in my paper also the positive externalities of, network, uh, of community networks. They not only provide access to the, to the internet, they, provide, they create new social bounds in the community, new, an entirely new economic ecosystem with new services, uh, new creativity, new application, empowering women because women get involved in the, the creation and the, the, the involvement and the establishment of the network, creating new jobs. Gifinet, which is the, m the biggest community network, has created more than 100 direct jobs of people that maintain the network. And this is based uh, on what already exists juridically on the international level, both the first uh, article of the uh, Declaration on, of, uh, of, of Human Rights, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the first article of the uh, International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the first article of the International Coven Covenant on Economic, Social and, and, uh, and uh, uh, Cultural Rights, recognize the right to, sel to self-determination as the right to pursue one's economic and social development. And this is a right of choice and the right of process. It means that people are right, are, have their fundamental right to define how they want to evolve economically and socially, and states have the positive obligation to allow them to do so. This is precisely stated both in the Article 1 in the in the 3 of the both covenants. So this is already something that exists juridically, and I think everyone should have the right to do so. Thank you very much, Luca. And um, I'm moving from the DC on community connectivity to another dynamic coalition which mentioned community networks in the paper. Um, Esmeralda from um, public, uh, DC on public access to libraries is going to answer my question about this. Because you made the point about marrying um, up community networks and public libraries. And you made some examples, I think it was Tunisia and Colombia, but it wasn't exactly on this issue. Um, I'm going to ask you how is your DC going to advance this marriage? How your DC is going to facilitate this marriage between community networks and libraries? Thank you. Thank you for your question. Yes, um, our um, dynamic coalition on public access um, actually was uh, the, the need for this coalition was realized in 2011 when uh, one of our partner, um, IFO, the Electronic Information for Libraries, um, shared an outcome uh, of a survey where the majority of um, 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 policy makers and politicians in developing country had a different image about what libraries and librarians do on an everyday basis. And um, a lot of our work uh, is, uh, in fact, uh, in uh, um, both developed and developing country, but in, in especially in the developing country, the idea of uh, relying upon um, a network that is based in the community is um, absolutely fundamental for us. And um, the ways in which this can be achieved um, are actually part uh, of, um, were part of our discussion yesterday during our public access um, meeting. Because we, uh, when we were preparing for the, um, um, for the, the, all the, the various meetings here, we were discussing again public access, but then we said pu public access as its merits, everybody knows it. So what is the way to move forward? How can we, um, um, how, how can we, um, get together to sort of change whether the regulatory framework to allow this connectivity in uh, places uh, that might be remote or that might also be in developed countries. Uh, how can we do that? So there are two ways. The ways is like one way is of course to um, 
try to uh, push onto uh, local, regional and state governments to understand the need and the importance of public access to achieve a series of goals which were also uh, stated in the um, sustainable development goals of the UN but also at the community level we have a strategic uh, uh, network that is about of two million and counting libraries worldwide and uh, these um, libraries are all so very different. They represent a community. Community can be in uh, Southern Africa, in East Asia, and they have needs that are absolutely different uh, one from the other. So the first way I would, we would like to approach the needs of the community is to assess the needs and launch a survey assessment, a need survey assessment, and from there, also assess what are the infrastructures and tools available to move forward and provide access to these communities. Thank you very much. And um, another dynamic coalition who is doing a lot of work on connecting the unconnected. Christopher, I saw the very impressive long list of case studies from all around the world. Um, how are you going to use them? What is your next step? I know that you're a very new coalition and you're still kind of in the thick of it, collecting information and analyzing it. So what's your next step? So the next step is to uh, continue to consolidate the information and the, to begin to analyze it. For those of you who don't know, our dynamic coalition is dedicated to a, th a cause I think that everyone in this room shares. <coughs> there are seven billion people in the world. Only half of them are online and adoption rates are slowing. And it's not for lack of innovative experiments and ways to connect people. There are, there are hundreds of them. But no one is studying them in a systematic way. In particular, no one is collecting data about what works and what doesn't work. And even if there is data collected, it's done in a random way that is not consistent that allows pro across project comparisons. And so our commitment is to really to try to lay the empirical foundation for decision makers, whether they're ministries, or international finance communities, or what we're finding is even social impact investors on the private side are very interested in this idea, to try to pull this together and to analyze what models are working and what won't work, um, and what isn't working. So we are spanning both demand side and supply side interventions, because as anyone who knows this space, uh, the idea if you build it, they will come has not been true. That uh, digital literacy, and interestingly, maybe a blind spot for people in a program like this, Many people in the world refuse to adopt because they don't see the relevance of the internet for their daily lives. And so these become major issues as well. And we're also looking for scalable and sustainable models. If we're gonna get three and a half billion more people on, grant programs and social corporate social responsibility programs are very generous and an important part of it, but they're not gonna lead to three and a half billion more people. So um, we've worked with, we're co-conveners of connecting and enabling next, bi next billions here in the IGF. We're working in the best practice forums on gender. We're working with equals. We're working with best practice forums on local content. We have disability access programs, and we're, we're studying everything to get other communities in. And at this point, we have identified 750, roughly 750 uh, interventions spanning 150 countries, and they're all available on a, a database available through oneworldconnected.org. We are not just doing that, we've contacted all 750 and are conducting case studies with everyone who's willing to do so. We've developed 120 case studies spanning 50 countries at this point. And all, I confess, we migrated the server, only 25 of them are online right now, but all of them will be online early in the new year of those 120. And so what we're finding out is that, in fact, what we need to do is that, in fact, there's not one solution. Urban areas which uh, face uh, with challenges on digital literacy or poverty are different from mountainous or island societies. You see different levels of, of support, different pre-existing infrastructure. And what we're gonna have to do is develop template models of basic learnings to distill once the full data set is in to find out what works and what doesn't work. Last thing I'll say is the big step is to move outside communications ministries to health, education, and particularly finance. We're doing the gold standard of social science research, randomized controlled trials, to find out what's really working on development goals because internet connectivity, as much as we love it, is not an end in itself. It's a, it's a, the way to mobilize entire governments is to tie into other broader themes. Thank you very much. And another dynamic coalition, dynamic coalition on network neutrality. 
it's not like did case studies, but did the mapping exercise. And look, I know that mapping exercise, they are very extensive and then they can be very rewarding if you use them in a the right way. So you say that you're going to use it to facilitate the informed policy debate. Can you please elaborate like kind of how exactly, what is the use of this mapping? Thank you very much. First of all, uh, I forgot in the previous intervention because I had too much, too many things to say that I would really want to publicly protest against the MAC decision to slash our uh, time slot from 90 to 60 minutes because if you work over the entire year and you have to present a work and uh, collect feedback and debate it, 60 minutes is really not enough and 90 minutes maybe is not even enough so we should have maybe more but at least equally to the other time slot not less because it makes it very difficult to have a, con a concrete conversation and collect feedback having said that that i think that also my fellow uh, dc uh, coordinators share uh, i see heads <laughs> uh, in their <laughs> positive <laughs> uh, way I, I i'm saying that uh, the zero rating map that we have that we have cre created is so far in a beta version the aim is to collect data reliable data on what zero rating plan exists in the world uh, to inform public policy debate but also to is, is for every kind of stakeholder is for researchers for entrepreneurs for uh, any kind of user so uh, we have mapped 80 countries uh, we have an, a beta version that has been released yesterday is zero rating dot info you can freely find the, the the beta version and contribute to it the goal was indeed to also to stimulate further contributions and I think there was a very positive uh, reply uh, yesterday I was speaking both with regulators which is a very uh, uh, positive step because usually they are uh, maybe a little bit shy in contributing to this kind of crowd crowdsource exercise several regulators are willing to contribute uh, several civil society members have contributed so so far we have the, the beta version with 80 countries uh, we the, le the now it the, the exercise is still at, at the preliminary phase as I was saying is the beta version but there is already some in interesting uh, conclusions that one can draw uh, first of all that uh, it zero rating um, plans are much more common where there is no net neutrality legislation. Uh, secondly, that there are some uh, um, zero rate, some services that are, that are almost zero rated everywhere, such as the applications of the Facebook group. This is pri 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 primarily due to the fact that in the majority of countries we have examined, uh, there is the notorious free basic program where Facebook is always a must. Uh, thirdly, uh, it is uh, very uh, well. It is what I l last year I called in the, in the, la the previous section of the Dynamic Coalition the miniaturization of the internet, which is turning the internet from a general purpose network to a predefined purpose network. The combination of uh, limited data caps and a selection of services that is that spans from three to uh, 15, 20 may maybe means that the user will only use the tr will primarily use the three to 50 to 20 services that are uh, sponsored and the rest will not be used or only a limited use so the user rather than being a prosumer that can produce innovation can share innovation freely it's only a consumer of the uh, sponsored services which which is a pity and i don't think is the direction we want to move to forward to if we want to let people build their digital future thank you very much luca and unless i forgot someone i'm going to move to the last and the newest dynamic coalition, which is Jeremy Malcolm from DC on trade. And Jeremy, um, your paper is very impressive. I saw the full report, I saw the summary, and you say that you are developing recommendation for participation of diverse stakeholders in trade negotiations. And I know that there are different issues even within stakeholder groups right now. I wanted to ask you, because you are the newest coalition, right? Uh, what would be your what I call definition of success for the next year of work. How are you going to advance these recommendations which you make? Thank you. Well, we had our inaugural meeting um, yesterday and uh, one of th and part of the meeting was to uh, finalize our recommendations on transparency and inclusiveness of trade negotiations. And in a way, that was the easiest thing to do because there are the fewest differences within um, our community within any of the stakeholder groups on that. I think if you're participating at the IGF, you inherently realize the value of multi-stakeholder participation. So there's certainly um, 
a pretty easy consensus uh, on that, but it becomes more difficult when you um, have to reach consensus on substantive issues like, for example, should the promotion of um, the free flow of data in trade agreements be um, uh, encouraged or do we have concerns about this and if so, what are those concerns? So I think over the next year we will be trying to um, reach more consensus or more understanding at least on what should be the limits of the free flow of data online and um, should any of those limits be um, negotiated in trade agreements. Um, one of the other things that we want to do this year and one of our definitions of success will certainly be to um, extend the membership of the coalition to include more members of the trade community. We have plenty of members of the internet governance community, but I think our outreach to, um, to trade uh, lobbyists and negotiators is very important. Um, thankfully, just since yesterday, we have had a new government member join, so I think already we're showing some progress um, on that count, but that will be um, one of our main metrics of success over the next year as well. Thank you very much. And as we haven't exhausted your time, well, I think I might ask the question later, put myself in the queue for the general questions. And I think, yes, this is it. I think, um, I is anyone from the Dynamic Coalition wants to add something? Because we you had only three minutes. Yes, please. Okay, uh, I'm uh, adding to something Olivia said from the Dynamic Coalition on core internet values. And uh, want to respond particularly to your opening remark that uh, we are adding a new value freedom from harm uh, it is n uh, freedom from harm has been extensively discussed and uh, its importance has been well understood by the participants of the coalition but uh, it is not being added as a value for the reason that the values that are lying at the core of uh, uh, the internet are unalterable uh, they form the very foundation of uh, the internet and uh, those are inherent values and uh, for example if you talk about freedom as a value that 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 is never altered uh, uh, truth as a value it's never altered so the core internet values are all or uh, or are, are the inherent values so we will pay uh, uh, due attention to freedom from harm in our debates but uh, it's not being added as a value thank you excuse me uh, so that your name isn't enter, this is Avery Doria speaking, so that your name doesn't enter the record as a question mark, please remember to give your name when you start to speak. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, are there any further questions? Because I think that we finished the intervention from Dynamic Coalitions and I would really like to open the floor to whomever who wants to add something, ask something, grill these people sitting here because that's what they are here for. Um, yes, please. Yeah, um, I just wanted to echo the multi multidisciplinary or like cross dynamic coalition sentiment uh, as it's related to blockchain because blockchain actually poses significant risks to many of the goals uh, we, we talked about here. Being censorship resistant, being difficult to govern and control, uh, and, and that being actually one of the, the ways that it provides value is that it's difficult to interfere, interfere with. Um, you know, we definitely need to chat about how blockchain will inter 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 interact with your missions. Uh, thank you very much, Martin. Uh, you're the next. Thank you very much. For me, what we've been doing here over the years is very much a complement to uh, necessity, and that is to make sure that decision makers in their decision making don't make the mistakes that uh, were not foreseen so the unintended consequences uh, so in that way we are working on developing a good understanding of good practice in in all our areas over time um, i think it's very important for us to also ensure that we develop it beyond the groups that we are in at the moment uh, i call for clear attention for uh, getting out there with it and by trying to find other platforms and, and, and powerful partners that can help develop the faults further, but also spread the faults. Because it's great if you have great papers on good practice, it's even better if they're used. Uh, 
thank you very much, Christopher. You are recognized, but can we just because there, I, I think there was a question from there, right? Yeah. C can we first accept the of question course. because I think there are the hand before you. Uh, thank you, Andrea. And then we'll next. Thank you. Uh, this is Andrea Sachs. I want to emphasize something that I think is extremely important regarding accessibility. Am I not close enough? Sorry, I wanted to emphasize something I think is extremely important that Chadi Abuzara mentioned about working together with the other coalitions. We have an impediment when we have the calls. We really need to find a way to finance captioning so everybody can participate in the calls because I would be very happy to work out something with the organizers for that because I know there's a financial impediment to this. But I can't join WebEx very well and there are problems with that. But if we had captioning, there are chat boxes in there and there are other ways of communicating. And Zoom is being discussed now because our way of, this is a wonderful room. We've done it really well. Accessibility is important to every single dynamic coalition and access to be able to work together is even more so. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Christopher. You're the next. Thank you very much. Um, w uh, there's one other answer I wanted to give to your initial question. Another way we're going to take the work to another stage is we've invited project teams to come here and actually tell their stories in the first person. We actually have nine project teams who are actually building the internet. And I think many of what we do here at the IGF is at a very high level. And I think we benefit from that. If you came to the CEMD session on Monday, you heard from four of them. We have a session tomorrow at 1040 in room 12 where we have five more teams to tell from all different continents of the world to tell the story about how they, the challenges they face and the, uh, the things that they overcome. And I couldn't be prouder of them. And if you want to continue to get information about these stories, oneworldconnected.org, and that's with the number one, not the word, has a blog, it has all the stories, and we're having a platform for all the great work that they're doing. We have a Twitter feed, we have a YouTube channel, we have a Facebook group where we're pushing out all the content as much as possible because I think these are great stories and they need to be told. And I think that everyone in this room understands the importance of that more than anyone. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, please. Thank you, Khalid Prime from the Golf Center for Human Rights. Uh, I have a question for the Dynamic Coalition. Uh, do you have any initiative uh, to reach out to some regions that I feel strongly that they are underrepresented in this coalition? For example, I, I really, we have little information about your activities in the MENA region. So my question to the Dynamic Coalition and the other coalitions that uh, they made some uh, presentations just now, uh, do you have any initiatives to reach for uh, the MENA region or other regions? We just feel that we are not well connected to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Any of the Dynamic Coalition wants to take these questions about your co cooperation, collaboration, participation from, from, from the MENA region? Uh, Yes, please. Internet Rights and Principles Coalition is going to answer. Uh, Hanan Bujami, uh, co-chair of the Internet Rights and Principles Coalition. Um, I think this is a perfect space for everybody from all around the world to come, you know, to exchange stories and experiences. And I think we don't work at the regional level with regards to the dynamic coalitions. It's more of a, a global initiative and sometimes we do customize activities to be specific to a region, like IRPC already did that with the MENA region and I'm not sure if other dynamic coalitions are prepared to do the same, to be honest with you. This is not something, Alex, like all this work that you heard about here is like self initiated, kind of, <laughs> because people have interest in specific topics and they lead the agenda. Thank you very much. So it's not like any of the dynamic coalitions, so any dynamic coalition perceives itself here as a place to gather people to contribute and not go out and do outreach in the regions. Am I right? So th this was the essence of the answer. So yeah, please. <laughs> so <laughs> first Bishaka and then Christopher. Thank you. Uh, microphone. On. Yeah, uh, I just wanted to add to that while we don't see ourselves necessarily as sort of regional focused, 
one of the things we do try and do is get input from different regions. And the way we do that is sometimes, because the issues we work on in our coalitions are often issues that we also work on outside of our coalitions the rest of the year. So at meetings that we may convene, we, for example, at the DC on gender and internet governance, some of our positions are building from a document called the Feminist Principles of the Internet. And these principles have actually been evolved in consultation with civil society groups around the world through meetings that have been held in different regions. So in that sense, there would be participants from MENA as well as from other regions who are shaping the agenda. So it's not sort of a direct thing, but in an indirect way, I think there is, are very strong regional voices in this process. Thank you very much, Christopher. You're the next. Well, thank you. Um, it is important for us, for our project, to reach out to all regions of the world, and we pride ourselves on it. Uh, spanning 150 countries, by definition, we are in every region in the world. Specifically with respect to MENA, we actually have a number of case studies, the most important of which is Tawasol in Tunisia, which is an education-based case study in a fan doing fantastic work. And we actually even spoke at an ITU event by invitation in Morocco to try to, to start to share with those communities some of the things that we're learning. This is very preliminary about six months ago. It is something we're actually in the next phase are looking for venues to speak and to share the learnings after we've consolidated them. So we'd welcome the opportunity to engage. Uh, thank you very much. I see that Olivier wants to add something, but I also remember about MENA region, for example, Dynamic Coalition on Access to Public Libraries also had a case in Tunisia. And, and now, um, Olivier, John. <laughs> Thanks very much, Tatiana. Um, you'll notice that most of the Dynamic Coalitions perform their own outreach in their own ways and their own networks. Um, at the same time, there's also this outreach that is required at IGF level. And this very meeting is a meeting to outreach to all of you to take part. The Dynamic Coalitions really welcome new participants. All of them welcome new participants. We're not just here to talk to each other. Actually, we have very regular calls. The different DC chairs have very regular calls. And one of the discussions we've had is how to actually have better outreach within the IGF, how to get more people involved, not only in the global IGF, but with regional IGFs and in the national uh, IGFs. So it's really a case of trying to pull more people in and get more people to be involved in the dynamic coalitions. Uh, so we can't really give all the answers. I think part of it is that you have to give us some answers as to how we could do this better. It would be great to have some input from, from participants here um, in the room and how, how we can actually get the dynamic coalitions work more upfront and get people to have easier access to it, uh, et cetera. Thank you. Thank, uh, thank you very much. Uh, John, do you want to add something on this question about MENA? Yeah, just, just briefly to point out that the uh, ECPAT International, which is the convener of the Dynamic Coalition on Child Internet Safety, um, is itself a global NGO. Uh, and it, I think it has, we have now around 80 uh, chapters in, uh, on all five continents, including several in the MENA region, uh, who've contributed in one way or another to ECPAT International's work and input into the Dynamic Coalition. So whilst the coalition itself doesn't focus in a regional way, it is absolutely the case that contributions from different regions, including MENA, have been reflected in, in the work that we've been presenting, both in the Declaration of Rome uh, and, and here today. Um, so before I move to the next question from Yuta, I think there was another intervention on MENA question, so we wrap it up. Yes. Uh, Marilyn, yes, please. Yes, thank you. Marianne Franklin, co-chair of the Internet Rights and Principles Coalition. To follow up from my, my co-chair colleague, uh, Hanan Boujoumi, in terms of outreach and effect, the um, Internet Rights and Principles Coalition and the Charter has been um, a very present and involved in the European Dialogue on Internet Governance, which is held around the larger Europe. So that in itself is a place where we take the work. The Charter has been included in political processes in Brazil, New Zealand, and even Italy. So whilst we are all limited in terms of human resources and human uh, power, 
we are all working very, very hard to take the work out and bring the work in. So in that sense, it's a joint effort. But there's a lot going on. We just need to make clear what is already being done and then build on that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marilyn. And um, you, know, you, you, you had a question, right? So le le let's start with another question. Thank yeah, you. I wanted to pick up Jutta Kohl speaking from the Dynamic Coalition on Child Online Safety. I wanted to pick up a point that Bishaka made in her presentation about the concept of consent by design. And I think that is a very important concept that should be spread to more people. I've been to so many sessions where we were talking, for example, about violent content, about uh, out of my hands a session about sextortion. We are talking about consent with regard to the GDPR, which becomes very important now in the next year in Europe. So. Uh, the concept of consent by design could be very useful for a lot of work that we are doing, and I really appreciate the efforts you are doing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do you want to address this comment? Hey, I want to thank you, Tatiana, because till you asked that question, I hadn't actually thought of consent by design. But then I seriously, I mean, I think part of the issue is also because <coughs> we do talk about privacy by design, right? Mm -hmm. And it has, it is getting widespread acceptance. <coughs> so I think uh, we would love to actually collaborate and see how we could move things like this forward. Um, are there any further questions right now? I don't see any hands, but I would like to take it further with with Nicolo from from Plus pl Platform R Responsibility uh, Dynamic Coalition. What you wh what would be your opinion about you know platforms participation in all these processes? You know, building in ethical issues because apparently there should be a balance. You know, on how much the platform can do and cannot do. Can you maybe share your thoughts? I know it sounds like a very kind of um, a rather uh, question which has no answer for now, but how to keep this balance between what is needed ethically and what platform can do without stepping into private regulation with no borders. Okay, that's <laughs> a hard uh, question, but um, I think uh, the, the notion that was put forward here of uh, consent by design is an interesting one. And also I like the reference to um, the responsibility not only of platforms but users themselves because many of the issues are not uh, um, so much about the, 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 the role of the platforms in policing the responsibility the relationship between users but it's also about the user uh, about the the actual uh, impact that they can have with their actions um, so I think uh, a key role there is not only um, allowing users to participate uh, in the governance of the platforms uh, through tra transparency mechanisms, but also uh, informing users about the potential harm that their uh, actions can um, um, cause. <laughs> and another issue which I think is important is the role of anonymity on these platforms. Um, this is a, a key question because uh, many of the hateful uh, speech that you see on these platforms is generated by um, individuals who feel that they will not be caught. Mm -hmm. So uh, should platforms preserve a full anonymity for users? That's one of the key questions that we have to grapple with in the years to come. And I don't have an answer, unfortunately, to that. Thank you very much. John, you wanted to add something? No, it was a question. Ah, I, I was treating myself as a member of the public, if oh, I may. Oh, thi this is very good. <laughs> I welcome this, so please do ask the question. Yeah, it was to the Dynamic Coalition on Trade. Because uh, one of the things that we, as children's organizations, have been very concerned about is in the NAPFA uh, discussions that are taking place between the USA, Canada, and Mexico, which could be a precursor for similar trade negotiations that might take place in the future. But at the moment, it's limited solely to Canada and Mexico, uh, in the first drafts of the documents that the State Department have presented to the Canadian and Mexican government, there is a proposal to replicate Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act of 1996, a clause which is thoroughly discredited because of the way that it's protected Backpage, for example, and in fact is on the verge of being amended 
by the uh, U.S. Senate, uh, finally in recognition of, uh, of, of its inadequacies. So I wondered if that was the kind of issue that your uh, coalition was, was interested in, because we're very concerned, first of all, that it doesn't appear in the final text of the trade agreement between America, Canada, and Mexico, and that it certainly doesn't appear, by the way, speaking as post-Brexit Britain, I'm guessing that when we ha try to get a trade to deal with the, the United States ourselves, we certainly wouldn't want anything like that to reappear in it. Is, is that the kind of thing that you're looking at or, or could look at? In which case, if it is, I'm your friend. <laughs> will be my friend after uh, you hear what I have to say about it. Um, <laughs> okay, cool. Um, so Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, for those who don't know what it is, it's a provision of US law uh, which is basically a safe harbor for internet platforms. It means that they are not liable for the speech of their users. In other words, if a user uploads content to a platform that might be defamatory or it might be um, it might be a, a, a sex advertisement that might be um, uh, exposing the, it might be illegal for the user to do that, but it isn't illegal for the platform to host it because the platform is not treated as a publisher of that content. They're treated as an intermediary. So um, what Section 230 does is um, provides a safe harbor, as I say, for platforms for most types of content. Um, with the exception of a, a few things like federal criminal law um, is exempted from Section 230 already and copyright law is not treated under Section 230. It's tra treated under a separate law called the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. So with that explanation out of the way, um, the issue is whether this uh, provision of US law should become a regional standard in the NAFTA agreement and um, Mexico and Canada at the moment, and this is the good news for you at least, I think, um, are opposing that um, because their law doesn't work in quite the same way. They do have um, conditional, uh, I mean, platforms are not automatically liable for their users' content, but neither are they automatically um, given protection from liability. Rather, the courts in Mexico and Canada will take that on a case-by-case -case basis. They will look at, for example, has the platform encouraged or um, become aware of and somehow assumed responsibility for a user's speech on the platform. So um, I think, yes, in answer to your question, this is an issue that the Dynamic Coalition could take up, but whether we would come down on one side or the other, um, I'm not sure. I mean, it is an issue probably where it would be difficult to reach a consensus. And in those cases, we, at the moment, we've started um, by avoiding such contentious issues and focused on the ones that are more easy, like, as I said, transparency and participation. So um, I, uh, I'm not sure. I, I think there is merit in at least discussing it and exploring the areas of possible consensus or possible disagreement. Um, but I very much doubt that as a coalition, we would come down unanimously against the idea of um, the kind of safe harbor that we find in Section 230. Mm -hmm. I hope that answers your question. Uh, thank you very much. And I see that Nicolo has uh, either a question or comment. Up from that, since we are talking about platforms, uh, I cannot refrain from uh, um, just mentioning that I think here what we're talking about, Section 230, is one of the um, hot issues of discussion in the United States at the moment, uh, because for about 20 years this has served um, according to um, the, the common understanding of this uh, safe harbor. It has generated a lot of innovation. It has allowed um, U.S. companies to grow, and many would say that the, the reason why all these platforms are based in the U.S. is that they uh, had this protection where they were not considered publishers, and there is also a rule that says uh, the Good Samaritan rule. So whenever you intervene uh, to remove content that you consider inappropriate for your platform, you should not be responsible for that. So now that uh, um, we recognize that these platforms have gathered an immense amount of power, um, there is a discussion about reforming this uh, um, law in the United States. And this is precisely also the type of discussion that we are having in the European Union uh, on putting more responsibility on platforms to detect uh, and remove potentially illegal content. So here, the, the point that I wanted to make uh, following up Jeremy's 
is um, that a lot of this is being injected into trade agreements and uh, then requiring states to um, impose these uh, safe harbors into their laws or responsi enhance the responsibility of platforms directly <laughs> implemented into national laws without the participation of individuals. So this is why I think our dynamic coalition is, is important because we want to have this discussion by involving everyone here uh, because we fear that otherwise um, these new notions of responsibilities will be um, inserted into the laws by policymakers, or even worse, there will be uh, the results of agreements between copyright holders and uh, intermediaries that uh, lack the participation of civil society that uh, we all want. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, are there any, yes, please. Uh, I wanted to say that this discussion is fascinating and I do want to echo what other speakers said before about having more exchange between dynamic coalitions. Um, I, I think in these discussions of uh, ethical rules, I, I think we really need to make sure that all aspects of society are included. I, I was uh, several weeks uh, made aware and I, I was totally unaware of that, that in, in, in uh, there are European countries where Hate speech, for instance, uh, the, the definition uh, excludes uh, people with disabilities. So, um, um, and, and, and this, this was completely um, new to me, ununderstandable. So I think uh, this is just an, an anchor here that, that in these discussions, when we're defining ethical uh, requirements or making recommendations and suggestions that we, we, we have the broad reflection of uh, all actors in society. Uh, thank you very much. So, for the purpose of the transcript, it was Shadi Abu Zahra who was speaking. And now, Vlad, you're the next. Thank you. Yeah, um, I, I totally agree. And I want to kind of talk about and stress that actually uh, there are real fundamental limits to our ability to encode our values into technology. Um, for the technology to understand our intentions, um, we ha it has to have a, an idea of like the source of, an, of some information. And that has to do with like credential management, and credentials can be compromised. And so, and, and, and the only way to deal with credential compromise is to have waiting for you know for revocations and other events. And that is a user experience issue because you know before you do an action, you have to wait just in case that action was actually done by you know, someone who's impersonating you. Uh, and furthermore, um, we can cons you know the the idea of like withdrawing consent or with you know, uh, actually not knowing what you fully intend until you see what happens or realizing that you didn't intend something um, is something that's very hard to encode in technology. And it's actually very hard to even predict what software will do. And the reason why we have had relatively, uh, we, we don't bump up to this so much in platforms today is because the platforms have administrators who can see the human reality <laughs> and who can make changes to respond to that. If we move to a world with more automation and less human input, um, then the, that, that kind of human thing that's actually necessary to encode and to actually to, to bridge th the gap between our ethics and our intentions and the technology, um, you know, is, is, it's, it's, it's more challenging, more automated than this. So, you know, encoding consent is not easy from a technical point of view. Uh, thank you very much. I think the gods of transcripts um, refused to recognize the name, so that was Vlad. Um, uh, yeah, so one please, one more intervention, please. Yeah, this is Avery Doria. Oh, yes. Please, even people who were speakers before, remember to give your name at the beginning because I'm not sure that they can necessarily see who's talking, so they really need to hear your name at the beginning. Thank you. Uh, Minda, you, you would like to add something to this? Thank you. Um, thank you, Tatiana. I, I would just like to add, because we have been talking about cooperation and how everyone can have input, uh, and uh, I was just linking it up to the um, resource guide, because there's obviously the idea behind our resource guide and the reason why we brought it here in the first place. Um, because the resource guide was first developed uh, in the United States by uh, law uh, students from Syracuse uh, University, and that's when we first uh, um, brought it to the main session, uh, uh, dynamic coalition session last year. Um, and now we felt the need that you want to open it up. 
uh, and you want to the input of uh, um, a a any other country, any other uh, um, stakeholder group, so uh, even the input of all our sister coalitions. So I think it's a, a conversation about the importance of working together, the importance of coming to a space like the uh, IGF, uh, is it really taps into what we want to do to have this global feedback and to have uh, um, a document that can really be inclusive. Um, so I just wanted to, to show that that's really, really important discussion here about cooperation. Thank you very much. Um, anything else to add to this absolutely fascinating debate? I'm really happy we're having this discussion. You know, seemingly, and I think this would be the, my last word from the moderator, uh, when you open 13 papers, and I had to read them all, right? Whether I'm interested in the topic or not, I had to read the papers. And at the end, they all raised important point and y points and you feel like you're interested in any of the topics. And then you have to make a cue, you know, to, 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 to think about the flow of the session, to think what kind of questions can be asked here. And what I saw is that the dynamic coalitions have much more in common that it seemingly looked from certain disconnected papers or certain disconnected names of, of the coalition. And I'm glad that like so many of you had something to say on, 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 on several issues. So thank you very much. And with this, I think we will be um, running out of time soon. I would like to give it back to Avri and Marcus. Thank you. Thank you. Avri Doria speaking. Um, I, yes, I want to thank all of the, the dynamic coalitions that went to the work of putting up these papers. I want to thank everybody that commented on the papers. I'd also like to mention that the papers are still available, that they are still open to comment. One of the things that really impressed me, and this builds on what uh, Tatiana said, is, is the commonalities, the, the, the common themes, the, the threads running through, the notion of consent, jurisdiction, uh, and, and, and such. I also think we got a couple messages to take back to, to the multi-stakeholder advisory group, the MAG. I'm in my last day of it, but I'll take, or actually next to last day of it, um, and I'll take the message back that one about the, the time and the importance of the time. I think that the dynamic coalitions that, that grew up very independently have now begun to coordinate and, and and you know come up with a certain commonality are an important basis an important sort of ongoing engine a continuity for the IGF that's important I think that we're starting to get to the point where they'll actually have things that are very valuable outputs that can be used as input to other processes to other organizations to each other, the notion that coming together in this conversation actually enabled you to find out, oh, we actually have agreements, or oh, we actually have disagreements that are worth discussing and perhaps turning into larger discussions as we go on. I want to thank uh, Tatiana for drawing out these threads for reading all the papers more than once and uh, drawing out the themes that basically show us that continuity. So uh, I want to encourage everybody that's working on dynamic coalitions. I think I'll actually be working on a new one that's forming here and so I'll be involved even next year but as, as uh, in one of the, 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 the dynamic coalitions and I, I actually, since I will cease being the co-facilitator of the Dynamic Coalitions Group, I want to thank all the Dynamic Coalitions and my partner Marcus in basically uh, the partnership over the last two years, the work we've done to basically take Dynamic Coalitions sort of out of the basement of the IGF and really bring them into a certain amount of visibility and let people see how incredibly valuable they are. Thank you all, and I end this session so that we're in time for the next session to be able to set itself up. Thank you all.
Thank <laughs> you. 